Hi and welcome to this uh, YouTube uh, video uh, which, in which we're painting a Amory Leopard in pastels on the law. To begin with I've uh, taken a tracing of my original um, graphite pencil sketch and uh, just taken the basic elements of it, put it on tracing paper and what I've done on the reverse of this I've, I've gone over the side with black pastel, a black hard pastel like this uh, you can use a pastel pencil if it's easier for you. And then simply lay it down in position on top of your grey velour paper. Tape it down so it doesn't move. And all I did was then take uh, a little piece of scrunched up uh, paper towel like this. And just gently, with medium pressure, go over the whole lot like that. And that will now nicely and softly transfer your image, your drawing onto your velour paper. Like thus. Okay, uh, not too heavy. I don't want it to be too heavy for various reasons. Uh, one of those being the lighting, so I want to make sure that the outline isn't too dark. Um, not only for the lighting, of course, but for the fact that we have pale fur here and there as well. Now, if you um, order the kit, Home Workshop kit for this one, you will get uh, the outline printed on the roll paper for you anyway. That will save you a lot of uh, time and effort, I'm sure. Uh, so once we've got our image on the velour paper, the next step is to do what I normally call the tonal sketch, which is a bit like the underpainting in an oil painting, uh, whereby we get the shapes and the tones, and that will give you an almost 3D sketch-like image. Of course, we've got a lot of markings, spots, rosettes, and so on to uh, figure into the equation. So it's always a good idea, I think, to make sure you have pretty much the outlines of those markings in place before you start. Doesn't matter where you start, on velour paper you can start from the bottom and work up, or the top and work down, left and right and so on. Because once the pastel's on the paper, it won't move. So, uh, hard black pastel to start with. Um, it doesn't matter if you want to use a sharp corner for finer details, but I tend to use, at this stage, a more rounded corner to keep it sort of fairly sketchy. So if you want to have a little practice first in a, a more uh, obscure area, shall we say, then let's try some of these markings down here. So the only thing I need to think about really, well I don't need to think about it, the only thing I like to think about at this stage is the fact that these markings are all made up of fur and what I want to do is try and sketch the markings in black fur uh, in the appropriate direction. So you can get that information from your original reference photograph, or you should be able to, uh, and that will indicate you know, whether the fur is going that way, this way and so on. It soon will become pretty obvious if you're not sure, but it's not an essential part of the process this, but it's just something I like to do. I like to think about getting the fur texture started at an early stage. And of course the majority of the texture is uh, suggested by the length of the hair and the direction in which it's growing. And do be aware of course uh, an Amir leopard is still a leopard and leopards have rosettes rather than uh, spots. They do have spots around the face of course, but in the body, mostly rosettes, like any other leopard, like jaguars. Unlike cheetahs, of course, cheetahs will have spots on their body as well. So do watch out for those. Not all of them. So some of the markings are just markings, peculiar shapes. And that's why I always think it's a good idea to try and get the shapes the markings in, it's got the kind of outlines before you start to fill them in, fill them in with their fur texture. And that will give you a nice variety as well. Of course some of this process might involve you pushing or pulling your pastel in different directions, which I don't mind, but if you find that a little bit awkward and you can always turn your paper. What I'm trying to do is keep uh, the paper in a 
same place fixed so it doesn't interfere with the the video of course but I think if you get used to sort of pushing and pulling your pastel in different directions it does somehow make uh, the whole process a little more natural less carefully drawn in a sense but obviously if you're holding your pastel comfortably as if you're writing or drawing carefully then your marks might come out a little bit too too carefully controlled so I'm coming up to the ear in a moment now the ear as you'll see has a lot of shadow behind it also the ear will have black fur at the back so when we get to that we'll try and distinguish this area between what's black fur, what is shadows and so on. Notice the change of direction of the fur down here in the chest and the neck starting to swing out in that direction. So at the back of the ear we have a couple of little longer markings like that. Again look at the change of direction of fur starting to go up that way. And uh, this is a, a marking here. You should be able to tell quite easily on your photograph but if you can't then you can follow this. So those are all markings. Now the back of the ear Let's do the shape of it first, the outline, there we go. So, unseen on this ear really is the little dub of white fur right at the top. Um, leopards, tigers, generally, and other big cats with markings, tend to have uh, white spots on the back of the ears, just at the top. Lovingly called by scientists as well follow me spots, little spots that uh, the cubs can follow when uh, trekking through undergrowth or jungle, long grass etc with their parents, especially mum. Uh, you can see the white spot on the top of this one and that helps them to keep visual contact because obviously uh, in long grass of a similar colour through jungle and so on then the markings do act as camouflage and it would otherwise be a little bit difficult for the youngsters to see uh, their parents leading. So we're still looking at fur texture here going down this way now and you see I'm just, kind of just loosely following those little shapes that I made in the original drawing, the shapes of the markings. Now try not to get too tied up, too absorbed in creating exactly the right number of markings, exactly the right shape and so on. Uh, they will vary from cat to cat. Uh, at the end of the day, who's going to count? So nobody's counting, so very unlikely at least. So the ones at the top of the head, under the ear, now these are pretty much solid markings. You won't find any rosettes here, They're way too small. So just concentrate on filling them in and again even if you can't see the fur direction, uh, try and get your pastel marks going in the right direction because apart from anything else, if your pastel mark goes totally the wrong way and it becomes visible then it could be off-putting. But at least if you get a stray mark, unintended mark, at least it's going in the right direction and will be disguised or absorbed in the rest of the fur. I have this little heart shape here. Uh, 
and a few smaller ones around the cheeks underneath the eye and then we'll be pretty much done not forgetting the uh, whisker follicles and other things we have the scent glands here I'm going to switch to a slightly sharper corner here scent glands there and more spots whisker follicles which are obviously quite dark on leopards and tigers and basically pits or follicles where the whiskers grow out of that are surrounded by dark fur but they're useful because they follow the curve of the cheek to enable you to get a nice sort of curve shape there now we have a big dark patch of fur underneath going from the top lip into the chin this is pretty common with leopards and tigers and always make sure we put that mark or that big patch of dark fur down before any whiskers go on the whiskers go on top of that okay before I come to the eyes let me just put a little bit of shadow inside the ear there before we come to do the, the eyes what I want to do is just give that an overall fairly good rub it doesn't have to be too vigorous uh, the beauty of these hard pastels is that they, they stick to the paper really well the velour paper they don't create a lot of dust but all we're doing here is pushing what remains of the pastel on the surface into the fibres of the velour make, meant to make it stick the second thing we're doing with a good rub is to soften the edges as you see it makes it look a little bit softer already and the final thing we're doing is creating uh, another tone so we're starting to create a sort of light grey tone just slightly darker than our paper <coughs> so uh, we'll do the nose next I think and then onto the eye so the nostril shape generally this upper line like that that is the only hard line we have even though it appears to be a hard line on the photograph underneath it isn't it's a soft transition from the nasal cavity into the cheek so try to keep that lower edge a little bit softer rather than just a hard line give that a rub as well and then we have the upper line of the nose pad which is where the skin meets the fur so we'll pop that there give that a rub as well and finally the eye so the eye our leopard is looking up into the canopy let's assume in the Amir forest in the Amir region between Russia and China of course looking up into the canopy there maybe spotted a bird or something and started having a think about lunch so here's the tear duct this is a pretty standard shape as well you've got a slight curve there on the cheekbone then it curves back underneath into the tear duct and dark edges of the tear duct top and bottom the inside part of the tear duct is usually a little bit paler like so so it's kind of a, a channel between two hard edges two dark edges forming a channel in the middle where the moisture comes out of course so let's make sure we've got the curve of the eye looking up there we are and finally the pupil again looking up just dab that on do it little bit by little bit to make sure your left is looking where you want him or her to look there we go and then you can dab on a little bit more once you're happy with happy with the position give that a little rub too so notice i haven't done anything with the outline <coughs> the outline is quite pale anyway but what i want to do is introduce a little bit of backlighting as well so around here around the mouth and the chin it's quite uh, almost white fur along the top it's kind of yellowish fur yellow oak kind of fur but i want to keep that quite uh, i would keep away from the black if i do a black outline on there then it's going to be harder not impossible but harder 
to get a nice uh, backlighting or strong highlight with the white. Before we go on to thinking about the out outline anymore, what we need, need to do is the second part of the tonal sketch, which is the tone. So we sketched out our markings, the features, eye, nose and mouth. So now what I'm going to do is introduce some tonal values. I just want to bring that out a little bit more. Introduce some tonal values that will help to create form, 3D form, three-dimensional aspects such as the shape of the ear and, uh, and the cheeks and so on. Uh, so I'm going to use the side of the pastel for this. The uh, first thing is to create a shadow behind the ear. I can see the shadow amongst those markings there on the reference. So gently, remember, if in doubt, always start off light. Put your pastel on light, rub it in. If it needs another layer, put another layer on. It's better to do that than press too hard, make it too dark, and then try to try to take it off by whatever means, putty rubber, rubbing it down with a paper towel, all of those things, or rub it down but not out completely. So if in doubt, two light layers, three light layers, even something like that. So that's the shadow behind the ear. We've got a little bit of shadow inside the ear as well, which creates that sort of concave shape. And again, I'm brushing the pastel, even though it's on the side, brushing it in the direction of the hairs inside the ear, sort of that way. Around here, we've got a shadow uh, around the ruff, which is that sort of pointed bit of fur here, into the throat, into the neck. Again, look for the direction. So brushing that down along here. So these shadows then do help to show what's going on around it, especially in the face. We'll go to the face in a minute. Uh, we've also got some shadows down here, maybe maybe a little bit of shadow around the shoulder. One thing you can do if you're unsure about shadows in a, a coloured photograph, or tones generally in a coloured photograph, is squint at it. Squint at your colour photograph, that will help you to see tones a little bit clearer. Squint at your painting as well. So what you're trying to see is overall tonal values, not too much detail. Okay, so the important bit in the, the head. Now we've got a slightly darker bit underneath the eyes, around the cheekbone. We've got a lighter bit of fur just, just directly underneath the eye. Again, which a lot of cats with markings have, that helps to the take away the glare of the sun from their eyes when they're out hunting. So underneath that we have like a bit of a hollow there, a bit of a dip in the uh, skull structure, which is the cheekbone. And around the mouth. And then we have this oval shape here with the cheek sticking out. So we've got a little bit of tone behind it, a little bit of tone above it. And you'll see this on the reference, it's kind of a darker brown tone anyway. <clears throat> so a little bit darker brown just above the eye. So anywhere where you've got a bit of a darker brown, that will be your clue as to where these darker tones are. Go across the bridge of the nose and the tip of the nose as well. There we go. Not forgetting the eye. I know the eye looks quite bright on the photograph because of the reflection and so on, but eyes are always set well back. So make sure you've got a good, decent shadow in the eyeball itself. Around the base of the ear. And what we're left with is the grey paper indicating our lightest tone. So we've got the dark, medium and light. The dark being our markings, the dark fur behind the ear, around the chin. And our mid-tone, which we've just put on and the light tone, the highlight so far, which is the grey paper. Okay, let's rub some of those little bits of dust away. So what we need to think about now is our <coughs> background. While we're doing a tonal sketch of the subject, the background is included. That has tone as well. So what I'm thinking is uh, replicating something like the original photograph, 
which was taken in an enclosure, but it kind of has that feel of a forest background, a kind of uh, ambient forest background, if you like. Now bear in mind uh, your light source. The light is generally coming from top right in this direction, but I'm going to move it slightly behind, so it's not directly hitting uh, leopard on this side, but indirectly. And most of it is going to create a bit of a backlighting around here to lift it off the background. So what I want to do is create a kind of mottled foliage background. And to do that, I lay the pastel on the paper, the black pastel still, and create a little series of one inch squares, like a, a rather hit and miss patchwork quilt, where you've got some gaps, you've got the squares going in different directions. But the important thing is, once, once that is blurred, when you look at it blurred, when your eyes or something like that, then it kind of takes on the appearance of an out-of-focus foliage, like you would get with a camera. Okay, and to enhance that look, what I do then is rub it round and round as hard as you can. That will start to take off the sharp edges of your squares and again enhance the idea of it being a natural looking blurred foliage background. When you want it darker, usually in the corners, but not exclusively, then add more layers. And keep twisting and turning so your squares go in different directions. That will create more sort of chaos. And of course in a jungle or in a forest somewhere, wild forest, you want chaos in the background. Not organized, delicately drawn leaves or anything like that. And importantly, you want your corners to be darker to stop your eye wandering off the page. Darker corners always help to close things down. Let's have a little bit down here as well. So it stops the eye wandering off there and into the next painting on the wall. Okay, got that around and around as well. Now, somewhere around here we have the pale fur around the cheek and the chin. So as long as I remember roughly where that is, in fact, uh, if I'm just using pale grey tones like this, then I can create a bit of a background around that. It will paint, the white will paint over that very, very easily. Even if it's got a hint of green, then the white will paint over easily. I think the, the best thing you can think about uh, is to make sure that some of the background crosses over your outline to make sure it sits behind your subject, not around it. And as I say, the pale yellows, whites and so on will paint over that very easily. So that's our tonal sketch. Obviously we'll have a chance to come back later and uh, adjust some of the darks on there, but <coughs> for now, that'll be absolutely fine. Keep reminding yourself that at this stage it's still a sketch. Uh, focus your attention to details much later on when we've uh, done, certainly when we've done the next stage, which is our base colours. For our base colours, we're going to start with the background, and this is predominantly uh, going to be green, dark greens, mid greens, and light greens, all using the same colour, okay? So this is a kind of nice, it's almost like Hooker's Green. Hooker's Green was invented by a chap called John Hooker to uh, indicate. Uh, the colours of exotic foliage when you went on these uh, uh, trips with Darwin and the like. So uh, this one foliage or exotic foliage kind of green can be used over our tonal background and create a whole series of greens. In fact you can use black on top of the green and vice versa and do as many layers as you like. First of all what I'm going to do is still following the same procedure, that's the Sort of random squares, not too heavy. Always remember, even at this stage, put your pastel layers on light, run them in quite well, run them in quite hard, but um, don't put too much colour on too soon. You might not like it and it's going to be hard to get rid of. So, light layers, lots of rubbing in between and your background and your subject will be much deeper and richer 
as a result. As I sand down here, then we'll put a little bit just inside the edge of your leopard so it drops behind. Otherwise, you have a sort of grey halo around it, which looks a little bit artificial. You don't have to fill all the, the spaces in, of course. And one of the reasons I'm using the grey paper, by the way, even though our leopard is quite warm overall, is to kind of reflect the cool, dense forest of the Amo region, which follows the Amo River running between China and Russia, where these guys come from. So, following that, now you can either use your fingers, move it round and round. If you find that the velour paper is a little bit too uh, tiresome, too painful, which can be, uh, if you're rubbing it hard enough, you can almost burn your, your fingers. Scrunch up a piece of, piece of paper towel like that and use that to rub round and round. That will certainly soften it quicker, your pastel that is, than your fingers. It'll also take a little bit off. But if your fingers are up to the job, then use those. You see it kind of merges in with our dark tones with the black. What I want to see though is I don't want to see sort of dark grey uh, on my outer layer. I want to see dark green. So I always put at least two layers of the green on top of that. And that way at least two layers. That way you'll ensure that the darkest colour you see in your background is dark green, not grey, with a hint of green. Three layers of course if uh, need be. Depends how strong a colour you want. And remember you can always go back and add more dark, even light, or your black and white on top of these layers. Do as many layers as you like. Six, eight, ten, more than that. As long as you put your layers on lightly and rub well in between. Rub well to provide a nice firm bed of pastel for your next layer. If your previous layer is a little bit loose, then the subsequent layers won't stick very well. The final thing I'm going to do on the background here, just to add a hint of warmth coming from that sun, is put some uh, little bits of yellow ochre in there. That will also uh, benefit the painting as a whole because it in introduces a colour in the background which is also going to be in our subject. That's always a good thing if you can try and do that. Try and find a colour in your subject that you can uh, apply to the background as well. So uh, here I'm just going to put same thing, little squares, but just little haphazard squares here and there. They're not too strong. So if you get a little bit of catch it up in the edge like that, just rub it down, it'll be fine. So ideally what you want to do is a little soft tones of light in between the darker foliage. And there's no hard and fast rule to this. As you can see, lean back, squint, you can see these little specks of light coming through. I do prefer to use um, square strokes like this, like I'm using a one inch brush perhaps, rather than to create lots of little round circles which look a little bit artificial. I know sometimes they might look like little circles of light or bubbles of light on a photograph, but in a painting they can look a little bit uh, twee, a little bit artificial. And again, so even when you finish your painting your subject, you can go back and revisit the background, which will look different. It always does. It always looks a little bit lighter once you finish your subject. And you can have more darks, more lights, more colour, whatever you want to do. So usually I reckon at this stage to do about 80-90% at the most of the background, because it will change visually. Okay, 
just give it a final rub. So we now have some yellow ochre in the background which will be in our leopard. So that brings us to our leopard. Uh, and we need to put our base colours down here as well. Now we've got two base colours principally. We've got the yellow ochre and we've got the uh, light brown which is this sort of nice golden brown here. And of course we've got white fur as well. And white fur tends to be around the cheeks, under the chin and down into the neck. Okay, a little bit around here perhaps as well. Uh, but what we can do, because I don't want that to be pure white, is that where we have the more of the white down here and we can use the grey paper and these grey tones as a shadow colour. When we get to this area around here, around the cheeks and this bit here, we can use the yellow ochre as a base tone and put the white on top. That will uh, then subdue the white, make it more of a kind of creamy white. So let's see how it goes. First of all, what I'm going to do is use the uh, light brown and remember our shadow areas that we did here and and around here we're mostly in the areas where we have the sort of darker brown so that's where we're going to start I'm going to start here and what I'm going to do is try to follow the direction of the fur as much as possible even though you're painting flat because uh, as you can see elsewhere in the background you will likely catch the edge of the pastel at some point and as long as the edge of the pastel is going in the right direction, it won't matter. So little sections like that, rather than just paint it all over flat, doing little chunks of fur uh, texture. And remember, light layers. We don't want to swamp that with too much colour yet, but we always put another layer on later on, of course. And wherever you can see this sort of darker brown, then put it in. Doesn't matter if it uh, strays into an area that's uh, pale or yellow, that's fine. We want the colours to merge anyway. So try not to be too careful with it, too precious with it. What I do try to do is try to leave areas like below the eyes and in the corners of the eyes that are predominantly pale yellow or creamy colours. I do try to leave those as much as possible, but at the end of the day it's not going to matter too much. So over the nose, I'm going over the tip of the nose as well. So again, predominantly where we've got these shadow areas. And as I said, pull it out a little bit further so that we can apply a bit of yellow on top of some of these boundaries, some of these borders. And then the two will interweave, which looks somewhat natural. So I'll give that a bit of a rub. Then we'll take our yellow. What I'm going to do with the yellow is just take a little bit of the sharp edge on a separate piece of paper here, take a little bit of the sharp edge on the corners to make it a little bit more rounded, like that. And that's going to help me with these smaller areas. So it's like a quarter inch brush, or yeah, just over a quarter inch brush, something like that. So this is going to go everywhere else, apart from where you have the distinct, almost white fur, which is around here. So these lighter areas, work in between the markings, cutting back into our darker, oh, light brown, darker brown. It looks like darker brown, of course, but this is actually a light brown. In between the markings here. And you can use the corner as well. If you find the space is getting a little bit too tight, just make sure this corner is nicely rounded, not too sharp. And take it in between the markings around the top of the head and so on. And again, corners of the eyes, inside corner. 
This is the base coat, remember? The base coat for the white to come on the top. A little bit of thinking ahead is required sometimes, thinking about what the final colour should be. Is it pure white? Then don't put any base colour underneath. If it's not pure white, your final highlight, if it's very pale blue, for example, put blue underneath. If it's very pale yellow, put yellow underneath, yellow ochre in this case. And this is mostly going to be a very pale yellow ochre down in here. And then around it here. So you can, as you see, you can paint over up to brown as well. And down here we have some kind of highlights. We've got the, the folds. It's almost where the neck is folded a little bit here. You can see the fur folding as well. We're just catching some of these sort of pale yellow highlights. We'll let that fade out around here when it goes into the white. Notice I'm still stroking as much as possible in the direction of the fur. Well, there you can't see it, I'm squinting at my reference practically all the time at this stage, and then leaning back and squinting at what's appearing on the paper in front of me. Checking the tones, of course we're still adding tone uh, with the colour. Colours do have tone, so we're still adding tonal values here. It's important to keep a check on that. So we've got a little bit of pale fur, which is going to be backlit to a certain degree. Along here, still not an outline as such. And the hints of the yellow in between the brown, both inside and around the rosettes. But I'm not trying to paint every single hair. There are individual hairs you can see on the reference, but unless you've got a couple of weeks spare time to do it, then I wouldn't bother. You can create a really effective painting with very few fine details, such as individual hairs and concentrate instead on things like the lighting, which is more important. This is still very much the foundation, the second foundation if you like. First foundation being our tonal sketch, second foundation being the base colours. So it still can be fairly rough, doesn't need to be highly detailed. It's probably about it. It's going to give that a little gentle rub. It's quite a hard pastel, that yellow ochre. So it doesn't need too much of a rub. There isn't too much dust created, as you can see. <coughs> and then we'll think about where our lighter tones are going to be in a minute or two. So that's our base colours. That's the second foundation. Uh, most of the background is done. Um, so what we'll do next is come on to the next stage, which is adding the details. What I tend to like to do is have the focus uh, in a portrait around the head, which is, I suppose, fairly obvious, and I have the rest of it kind of fading out, so that the, as the eye wanders around, it kind of uh, forgets this little bit and maybe comes around to the head again. So focus on that, and then this, this little area down here can be a little bit more out of focus, a little bit more blurred. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, sharpen up some of the markings, the details, around the head and gradually fade it out down here. And what we're going to do is do a dark, medium and light. So that will mean using the black pastel first. Uh, the medium, which is going to be our yellow ochre to pick out some, some of the paler bits of fur. And then finally our white for our secondary highlights, the soft highlights. And then we'll talk about the final highlights after that. I'll come back to the eye very shortly. Let's do a little bit around the ear to get it started. So the ear on the far side, not too strong. I don't want it competing with the 
here in the foreground. Remember, the stronger the tone, give that a little bit of rub, the stronger the tone, the more it comes towards you. So this ear closest to us, which will be our leopard's right ear, that can be a little bit stronger. We've still got the pale white spot to put on there, of course, later on. So around the edge of the ear, a little bit of a, an indentation there, which is the area of the pouch, the cutaneous pouch, allows the ear to fold around, that little bit there. Because all cats have that, big and small. So I'm putting a little bit more pressure on with the, the black here. And the black fur on the back of the ear and continues down to create folds, markings, etc. around here. And they're all connected, so you know you might as well do the whole sort of section, ear section in one go. Sketching some more of that texture in. We'll give it a bit of a rub. Okay, so the ear obviously stands out now. What we'll do is then we'll start using the same tone along the markings here. All I'm doing again is sort of highlighting what's already there. Now what I want to create with these markings is not just go over them again and make them all very dark, but just sort of create reverse highlights. So some of the dark, which is now dark brown, uh, in areas. Let some of that show through as well. It just creates more depth, so just don't blindly go and fill it all in again. Otherwise there's no point in doing it at that stage. We might as well have just waited till now and done the markings. So give the markings some depth from the initial tonal sketch to the adding of the base colour and now to do a little bit of reverse highlighting. And it does make a difference. So even something like that, even something like leopard markings, cheetah spots, tiger stripes, will have more depth if you approach them this way. Leave some of the under underpainting, if you like, show through here and there. And always, when you do a marking like that, give it a good rub, help to soften some of the hairs that we're sketching in. I also drag a little bit of that tone to the fur around it, which ties things together again. You notice on the reference here, there's quite a, there are quite a few almost heart-shaped markings. There's one there I can see, I think there's one there, this one, and one there. Now, of course, if you do this and you suddenly think, oh wow, those markings are just way too dark, way too black, you don't need to worry about that, because you can just do a, a glaze, a thin wash, if you use the term wash, of colour over the top. So you can use a dark brown over the top, and that will then make your uh, black marks kind of dark brown, very dark brown. And as long as you adhere to the idea of putting on light layers and lots of rubbing in between, you can then easily, if you have the time and indeed the patience, you can easily create hundreds of layers of fur. You don't have to, of course, but you could. So let me just demonstrate that. So this area here, I want to kind of subdue a little bit. So I'm going to take my light brown again. And I'm just going to go over that from the edge of the paper to make it a slightly darker corner. And you see what it does to the black markings? Just makes them a dark brown. And it helps to fade them out. So here and there, if you think the markings are a little bit too too bold, just gently go over with a bit of colour like this. Right, so around here, I do want this to be a little bit stronger. Just go gently go over with a bit of colour. And I will just knock them back. Not too much. 
And if you find, of course, you you've made them too brown, then go back with your black and revitalize them again. So around here, I want to, do want them to be a little bit stronger because this is the area I want people to focus on. And if the markings are stronger, darker, then people will see them first. Stronger tones do include highlights, not just the black. So any stronger tone, in fact highlights are usually what people see first anyway, if they're strong. If you're using subtle highlights, then maybe not, you'll see the black first. But if you're using strong highlights, primary highlights, then people will pretty much always see those first. So put throw it down here. So we're using the grey paper as our shadow tone in this white fur in the neck. And again, same sort of principle as before, highlighting our markings with the black, not redoing them, leaving some of the original tones and shapes showing. I see another heart shape here. When you start looking for these heart shaped markings, you'll start to find them everywhere, I think. So we've got some little bits of fur texture in between these markings where we see it. I see a little edge of texture there. I can see some here. And as you see already, we have these tones and these colors starting to merge. And they'll start to merge more with the more layers that you do. And you can do as many layers as you want. And that gives you a sort of deeper, richer, for texture anyway. But as I said, you don't have to do lots of layers. It's entirely up to you. So once we've done our markings around here, then we'll have a look at our highlighting. What we're going to do with the highlighting and the backlighting. So we shouldn't have to touch the markings again. Let's make a little bit more of a darker area in the centre of the ear. But if you do have to touch them again, then it's not a problem. Let's go back and touch certain things up. Because as we see, these whisker follicles, whisker follicles, I beg your pardon, are particularly strong, particularly dark. And don't worry about having this weird patch here where nothing seems to be happening. That will be taken care of when we do our whiskers. Still quite a few spots down here. If you've lost track of one or two of your smaller spots, then don't worry. Just redo them. If they're in a slightly different position, it doesn't matter. And no one will notice. Nice dark patch along the side of the chin. If you've got any little bits of black pastel there, if you're working flat, and I've got some black pastel just on there, just flick them away with a bit of paper towel like that. Don't rub them with your finger, otherwise you'll rub them in. Make a little smear of black, probably where you don't want it. So we're almost at the eye. Okay. So nostril first. So again, that top curve of the nostril is the important one. And then pull it away from that top line. So it kind of fades out onto the cheek and the area between skin and fur. Uh, a little bit of a, a ridge along the top there where the skin joins the fur of the nose and the eye. So as for the eye, now what I'm going to do is uh, do a kind of greenish yellow combination. 
So what I'm going to do is first of all take uh, the green. So in green is red in the background, and remember we can use similar colors in, uh, in our subject in the background as much as possible. Take a corner of that green, round it off, so it's not too sharp. And then, not too heavy, just do a gentle coat of green on the eye there, rub it in. And then with the yellow, lower part of the eye mostly, top part is going to be a shadow, add a touch of yellow to that, so it's more of a kind of greeny yellow than green. And add a rub. So what we're going to do is, uh, our light is coming from here, we're going to have a little bit of a reflection on it uh, towards the right hand side. The left hand side with the light shining through the eye is going to have a little bit of yellow, just there, that shines through the clear gel of the eye and lights up the iris on the opposite side. I'll deal with the reflection in a minute. Uh, shadow wise, we haven't got too much of a shadow. We normally you get a shadow underneath the eyelid. So the eyelid is here with the eyelashes included, looking up. Uh, if the eye was pointing downwards and the light was coming from, say, from here, then you'd have a shadow underneath, a big shadow underneath the eyelid, but not too much here. So it's going to be mostly on the right hand side where we've got the nose coming in the way. So if the nose is in the way, you'll get a little bit of shadow uh, to the left of that. So always think about what's getting in the way. The edges of the tear duct, we can just redo those. And again, just gently darken the inner channel of the tear duct. The shadow is going to come all the way down here. The pupil, pretty much where it is there, looking up. I want to just strengthen the marks around the eye as well, keep them all so they're pretty much the same strength. So above and below, something like that. Okay. So finally, let's talk about uh, reflections. Uh, we'll talk about our secondary highlights and our primary highlights. So secondary highlights are those which, uh, for example, are highlighting soft fur and so on. Primary highlights are added finishing sparkles, like the reflection in the eye, the sharp, more intense white of backlighted white fur and so on, backlit white fur and so on. Uh, so first of all, uh, secondary highlights, that could be a mixture of yellow ochre. So for here, for example, use the corner of that just to get a little bit of fur texture around this area of the cheek. That could be uh, a bit of a stronger highlight below the eyes, which we're going to add some white to that very shortly anyway. Corner of the eyes, maybe above the eyes, using the yellow primarily as our intermediate highlight, our secondary highlight if you like, on that fur. Because none of this is going to be intense white. Maybe the same with the hairs in the ear. Your little yellow bits. Your little Highlighted bits of fur in amongst those that brown area. Just a little stroke here and there. Now we're coming into the very pale fur around the edge of the cheek and the area of the rough. I'm going to use a, a softer corner for that, a rounded corner. So. Round the corner will give you a softer mark, so I'll round it off quite a lot. Uh, what I'm after is, is thick fur, fur texture. I'm not trying to do individual hairs in this area, just thick fur texture. So putting that down to about here, I think. And remember, this is our main area of focus. So 
some of the highlight shows on the, the creases that we have here in the fur and then kind of let it fade out along the back and indeed the top of the head where our fur is yellow brown anyway you're kind of yellow ochre with a few bits of white maybe the same across the bridge of the nose as well and the fur along the back so again well now what I'm going to do is create a sort of furry outline like that and then just drag it back a little bit so it's not just outlining or highlighting a two-dimensional cutout it's now creating a 3d image a 3d backlighting effect and there's a little bit of yellow as a base around it here okay so so a little bit around the nose so we're now about to put our primary highlights in which is the white fur and the reflections in the eye and so on and then we're going to have a look at uh, anything that might need to be done to the background so white pastel hard white pastel uh, to begin with let's try uh, just lighten up some of this fur along the back so gently gently go over the yellow and you can see what we're creating now here and there is a pale yellow soft backlighting okay so that goes back to what i was saying about think about your final highlights what color what tone how warm or how cool should they be and introduce that tone well that warmth before you put the white on I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna show our white spot at the back of the ear a little bit more than it's shown on the reference and it's hardly shown at all on the reference so I'm going to put it in and on the top of that ear of course the back back of the ear at the top then we've got some ear whiskers ear hairs sticking out there again catching a lot of light of course and some in here and nice and wispy so in fact growing from there to there but it doesn't matter which direction you strike them in whichever is easiest for you but I will rub away where the hairs start which is this side the inside of the ear inside meaning closest to the head edge of the ear that's almost white But not quite so let's go around here we can see just hint of the eyebrow on the other side there that's what this is and it gives it a nice little angle there and again where we can just with a sharp corner pull out a few eye whiskers on the far side there And of course we have the pale hairs above and below the eye which are going to be pale yellow so we have the yellow there already working in between the markings and of course corners of the eye this is a little bit brighter still don't forget if you get any stray bits of white pastel dust just look, waft them away with a bit of paper towel like so and they pale fur on the cheekbone the lower part of the orbital socket there but I think we'll do our reflection before we do the whiskers at the end keeps it nice and fresh so around here let's uh, bring out the shape of the nose A 
around the tip of the nose and for the first time we will now do the edge of the cheek on the far side, that shape there. That's the first time we've that's been touched so it's nice and pure. Bring some of that white back, especially on the right hand side, into the cheeks. And chin. So it's the first time we put any white in the chin. There's a little bit of a leaf stuck to his lower lip I think in the original reference so ignore that of course. Let's get the shape of the chin. Nice and strong, that's almost pure white fur. So any kind of backlighting is going to make it nice and strong. Waft away any, any dust. Put a few whiskers on. Use a sharper corner. And then make sure the whiskers are nice and visible because they are being backlit, of course. Bring that down. Again, different from the photograph. Now we're backlighting, we want to see this paler edge coming down into the neck, into thicker fur, using a rounded corner, thicker fur texture into the neck. Catching the light from behind. Going into paler yellow fur here. Keep squinting at it, that's the important thing, once you keep squinting at it you'll get to see what those highlights look like. And when you want to lift the leopard off the background quite a lot, so make sure that if you need a second pass with the white to lift it off even more then do it. Okay so we've got pale yellow fur around here, so don't press too hard. All you're doing is making that yellow ochre a little bit a little bit lighter. So medium pressure at the most. So that's just the same as taking a yellow ochre and mixing a bit of white paint to make it lighter of course. No different. And the less pressure you use then the less white paint you're adding in a sense. The more pressure you use then the more white paint you're adding to that yellow ochre. And therefore making it much paler. Again, keep squinting. It doesn't need to be as bright as the photograph on this side because we've changed the light a little bit to make a more of a back lighting than a direct lighting. So it looks almost white on the reference, so you don't need to make it as white as that. You can keep it a lot more subtle. We'll have a little bit more on here, I think. And then we'll do our whiskers. And then finally the reflection. So some more stronger eye whiskers there. So whiskers, always shorter and finer at the front, longer and thicker at the back. And if you make sure you have a nice sort of fairly sharp edge on all I do is basically is break the tip off there and it gives you some nice sharp edges on the end of the pastel. Shorter and finer ones like this are quite easy, so you just very quickly, not too much pressure, sketch those on, covering that black, and then as they start to get a little bit longer and thicker, then start make your starting mark there. Don't put too much pressure on, maybe medium pressure, because you don't want to snap your pastel halfway through. Uh, sketching some nice long whiskers like that and then what I find is quite easy on velour especially is that you then go back pick out one or two of these whiskers and thicken them towards the base with another layer maybe a little bit more pressure and they tend to follow the, like a little uh, channel that you made with your white pastel and they seem to be able to follow it quite easily as well now if you 
what we want to do is bury the roots of the whiskers, that's the first thing. But as you find that you've kind of messed up this dark area a little bit, this here, then no problem. Because what we're going to do, first of all, some of these whiskers where we can see the starting mark, we're just going to gently put a little bit of black pastel over the starting point to bury them. And secondly, what we can do is we're going to sharpen these whiskers even more by putting some of this black fur back in between them. And that will make them stand out even more. It will also make them look a little bit sharper edged. And stops your nice big chunk of black fur looking too muddy as well. So you can see they can then go back and then just sharpen up some of those thicker whiskers at the base. You don't need to do a whisker in one shot. Sometimes you have to kind of dress it up a little bit or dress it down a little bit in some cases. If that's the case, then that's fine. Okay. Final thing is our reflection. So we've got the light coming from down here. So what I tend to do is pop a little reflection on the side of the pupil where the light's coming from. It's really low down like that, follow the angle. Because if your light's coming from there, then your reflection will change accordingly. Just a little soft blur. Give it a squint test, lean back and squint. If it's not too obvious, it probably wants a little bit more on it. Same with all your other final highlights. Give them a little squint test. And finally, if you feel you muddied up some of your, which can happen, which invariably will happen, some of your markings around the eyes, the eye area is the most important. So to go back, revisit them, refine them a little bit again to make sure that important areas like the eye area are stronger, more visible. And you can repeat those layers as many times as you want, making the image softer, making it more visible in some areas less visible, immediately visible that is, in other areas. Focusing people's attention where you want them to look most, i.e. the head, the face, and so on. Making sure those have the, those are the areas of the most contrast, light and dark. And then the rest fade out. And just a final touch around the nose, I think. That's a nice sort of shiny nose. And around here, that white fur. And I think we'll call that finished. So, hope you've enjoyed that. And if you do want to have a go, remember you can uh, order the kit uh, following the instructions on screen at the end of the video. So if you do have a go then as always we'll be happy to have a look at it for you and post them to your social media account whatever you like to do. So thanks for watching and we'll see you again next time.